welcome back to the Trauma Therapist Podcast. My name is Guy McPherson. My mission is to help trauma therapists be their incredible selves, to be human, to be real, not just a clinician. I'm a big believer in who we are is more important than what we know. And this requires cultivating authenticity, genuineness, and vulnerability, and that requires intention. You can learn more about my courses and workshops by going to the thetraumatherapistproject.com. That's the thetraumatherapistproject.com. Let's get started. All right, Judith. So five, four, three, two, and one. All right, folks, welcome back to the Trauma Therapist Podcast, a very special episode. I'm very excited and honored to have Dr. Judith Herman on the podcast. Judith, welcome. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. So Dr. Herman is a professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. She was the recipient of the Lifetime Achievement Award from the International Society for Traumatic Tr Stress Studies and is a distinguished life fellow of the American Psychiatric Association. Today, we're talking about her new book, Truth and Repair. A little bit about the book, the conventional retributive process fails to serve most survivors. It was never designed for them. Renowned trauma expert Judith Herman argues that the first step toward a better form of justice is simply to ask survivors what would make things as right as possible for them. In this new book, Truth and Repair, Judith commits the radical act of listening to survivors, recounting their stories. She offers an alternative vision of justice as healing for survivors and their communities. Her initial work, first work, Trauma and Recovery, The Aftermath of Violence from Domestic Abuse to Political Terror, is revered as a seminal text on understanding trauma survivors. Judith, welcome to this podcast. Well, I'm happy to be here. So look, this book, and we're going to talk about this book, is amazing. It, it's kind of, I had so many uh, emotions as I was reading this, like what the heck is going on, anger and all of it. But before we get to that, please share with our listeners um, just a little bit about you. Where are you, where are you from originally and where are you currently? I was born in New York City and grew up there. Um, and I came to Cambridge, Massachusetts as an undergraduate to go to college and never left. So I'm here still. <laughs> and never left. All right. And just, I, I know our listeners want to get to this book, but just how the heck did you get into this field in the first place? Well, that's a long story. Um, depends how far back you want to go. Um, my, I, I'm the granddaughter of uh, Jewish immigrants from the Pale of Settlement in Europe, Eastern Europe. Um, my grandfather came in 1887 to escape the Tsar's army, uh, worked as a salesman on the Lower East Side while he learned English and saved money to go to medical school and became a doctor, a, a general practitioner on the Lower East Side. Uh, his daughter, my mother, became a psychologist. And... Uh, when I told her that I'd like to be a psychologist like her, she said, oh, go to medical school. You'll have a lot more power that way, which is true. Uh, but of course, I think she also wanted me to follow in her dad's footsteps, which I, I'm named for him. So, so the older you get, the more you realize that you, what seem to be your individual choices in life uh, uh, have a lot of historical background. That's that's my historical background. When I um, was beginning my psychiatry residency in 1970, I had just joined a consciousness raising group, Red and Roses Collective Number Nine, um, and uh, so I was listening to my patients with a, a new awareness about mm -hmm. the condition of women's lives, including the prevalence of violence against women. And so when my first two patients on the uh, inpatient service where I began my residency uh, 
were women who had been hospitalized after serious suicide attempts. And when they told me that both of them had been sexually abused by their fathers, I actually listened to them Mm -hmm. and I actually believed them. And uh, I began to understand the connection between childhood abuse and uh, a sense that one didn't deserve to live or want to live as an adult. Mm -hmm. Uh, So that was, I really credit women's liberation for everything. I would, I'm the, the comprehensive textbook of psychiatry at that time, that was the basic text, estimated the prevalence of all forms of incest as one case per million. And yet I had my first two cases. I mean, what were the the odds of that? Right, right. Um, So one thing led to another. Um, A colleague and I, Lisa Hirschman, very soon collected 20 cases just by asking around among people we knew. Uh, and we published our results in 1975 in a women's studies journal that had just started. And what do you know? It's the between the time the paper was accepted and when it was published, we started. It was it had, it was being copied and passed hand to hand, and we started getting letters from all over the country saying, you know. I thought no one would believe me. I thought it was my fault. I thought thought I was the only one. And so, you know, in the same way as the speak outs on rape and the speak outs on intimate partner violence raised public awareness, we followed in that train of revelation. Uh, So so this this within the context, like you said, of the the culture thinking this was rare, right? Uh, This kind of abuse was rare. Because this was just what what girls fantasized about, right? Right, right. This was supposed to be what we really, really wanted. Right. Now, when you were hearing this, when you were listening to these women share these stories, how did it land on you? How did, uh, how did you, were you able to take that? I mean, because look, this is not easy stuff to hear. Yeah. Well, I think it was because of all the support I was getting from my consciousness raising group and from the nurses. I <laughs> listen to this. I because I w- was in that moment of awakening. You know, mm-hmm. uh, I decided that I would respond only to one sexist slight out of 10 in my everyday. And so I was very, I was mouthing off all the time. And as a result, I was very popular with the nurses. So um, I I had a lot of support and I think, and I had good, some good supervisors who mm-hmm. didn't who, who got it and who didn't say to me, oh, poor naive resident, didn't you know that this is just, you know, a fantasy? Mm-hmm. But they took it seriously. And mm-hmm. so that was also a huge help. Mm-hmm. Um, at what point uh, did uh, Trauma and Recovery come out? When did that book? And why did you write that initially? Well... One thing led to another. Actually, my first book was actually called Father Daughter Incest and mm. was published in 1981. Um, and uh, I think kind of I, I, I'd also, on the strength of that, I'd also been invited to join the Committee on Women at the American Psychiatric Association. Um, and I was invited to join the uh, Department of Psychiatry at Cambridge City Hospital, which was uh, had just become a Harvard Medical School teaching hospital and was very innovative at the time. It was, it was a public sector safety net hospital that treated all the patients that nobody else wanted to treat. 
And it, uh, the people who were building the department were very interested in community psychiatry, which is now just being discovered after, you know, uh, this was in the era of deinstitutionalization when the idea was that people with serious mental illness could be treated much more humanely and more um, economically in the community. Um, and we all know what happened with that. Uh, the state hospitals were closed, but the community programs, uh, once Ronald Reagan came in, were were never built. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, the 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 prisons and the streets are now where we have our people with severe mental illness and addictions. Um, it, it, I don't get me started on that. Uh, that I mean, it enrages me and makes me want to cry and all of that. It's just, it's a scandal. It's a Shonda. It's a disgrace. Um, but anyway, Cambridge Hospital was actually do you know, walking the walk. They had wonderful community programs. Mm-hmm. Um, and they got a small grant, $6,000 from the city of Cambridge to develop mental health services for crime victims. Well, none of the guys who were running the department was interested, but they hired my colleague, Mary Harvey and me to come up with something. Um, And that's how we started the Victims of Violence program. We went down to the district attorney's office and talked to the victim witness advocates about, you know, what kind of services do your clients need and we built from there Mm -hmm. Uh, so um so we were building a program and most of the patients we saw were survivors of child abuse sexual assault domestic violence we also saw but we also saw Uh, people who were seeking political asylum as refugees. Um, And we, uh, we, um, Mary and I joined a study group that had uh, been started by my colleague, Bessel van der Kolk. He was working with combat vets at the time. And he brought together people working with different kinds of trauma we had somebody who worked on the burn unit at Mass General. We had uh, somebody who, you know, worked with abused kids and so on. Mm -hmm. And um, in that study group, it became clear. um, We we met in people's houses once a month and somebody would present their work. And it just became clear to me that trauma is trauma, whether you're talking about rape survivors or combat veterans. Mm -hmm. You know, or whether you're talking about prisoners of war or battered women. You know. uh, now, when you say trauma is trauma, do you mean how it impacts the body, how the nervous how system? How it impacts the body, brain, and mind. Right. Uh, that uh, whether it's in the political realm of consensually validated trauma like combat um, or genocide. Um, or whether it's in the private realms of, you know, femicide, uh, it's it, it's the same animal. So that's really why I wrote trauma and recovery to say, uh, trauma is trauma. And I mean, it's it's pretty incredible uh, to to think that that that's like the seminal work. In the, you know, you're smiling. I mean, that's pretty amazing. You know, I mean, that you're that you you wrote that book, um, and and now we have this book here, Truth and Repair. Why did you write this book? First off, well, it's been kind of percolating on the back burner for quite a while. I actually got started on it more than twenty years ago. Um. I had a fellowship at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study where 
I had this idea that, I mean, I had, I had seen what some of our patients went through if they tried to seek justice in the conventional justice system. And most of them, of course, never told anyone, never mind reporting to police. Or, but some of them did. Mm-hmm. And most of them were not happy with how they were treated. Um, and so I had the idea, well, let's, uh, let's see what, let's ask them what, what they really want mm-hmm. instead of assuming that they're just vengeful. I and mean, there was so much stereotyping of, you know, women lie, women are vengeful, um, women fantasize. Um, uh, and anyway, why would, you know, what was she wearing and what did she have to right. drink? You know, um, so they were being treated more like the, the, the suspects uh, than as victims. Um, in the courts. And uh, so that's really how the project began. And I guess the the conceptual framework for it was that if interpersonal trauma um, uh as opposed to accidents and natural disasters and so on. Um, If interpersonal trauma is a crime, is an injustice, is an abuse of power, then it's not just an individual problem, it's a social problem. And that also was a a big argument Mm -hmm. in trauma and recovery. This isn't, you know, um uh this is not a quote unquote private misfortune this is uh, just look at the epidemiology and you'll see that this is a a big social and political problem um so if it originates in abuses of power and it originates in injustice then wouldn't some form of social justice be part of the solution? Wouldn't that be? It, the individual recovery is not sufficient mm-hmm. to solve a social problem, either for the individual or for society. Um, so where's, where's the social justice solution? Let me just interject here. So I just want to remind everyone that I'm speaking with Dr. Judith Herman. Her new book is called Truth and Repair, How Trauma Survivors Envision Justice. You know, as I was reading this book, I was completely enthralled and enraged. I don't think you can read this book without being enraged. And as as a man, thinking how um, embedded this this patriarchal view is in our society and how women are treated and how uh, they're mistreated and thinking that, like you said, you know, healing and and, uh, justice isn't just good enough on an individual basis. It's not even sufficient, but to then think, okay, well then how are we going to do this culturally? You know, that to me almost seemed Gargant, like a gargantuan task to me. It almost felt, it almost felt hopeless to me. Mm. But before before I go there, I I was I was taken aback by, uh, you know, in this book you talk to a lot of survivors and you ask them, you know, what do they want? What do they need? What do they feel would help them? And like you said, it wasn't. Um, punishment in a sense. It was, I want them to be held accountable. I want them to listen. Talk about that a bit, if you would. Okay, sure. Um, yeah. Um, I think 
the big surprise was that pretty much everybody agreed that the main thing they wanted was the truth to be out there. They wanted the perpetrators exposed. They didn't necessarily want them punished. They wanted them exposed and contained. They wanted Mm -hmm. limits set so that they didn't do it again. And they wanted the bystanders and the enablers and the larger society to take some responsibility. First of all, for support, for for uh, recognizing the truth and recognizing their own role, whether passively or actively com- complicit, uh, in facilitating this kind of impunity, that's making this behavior just normal right. and acceptable. Um, and they wanted the main focus to be on the, the bystanders taking some responsibility for apologizing and making amends to them. They didn't necessarily want money from the perpetrator. That kind of made a lot of people feel uh, dirty. You know, I, I'm not going to, that's disgusting. I don't want anything to do with that guy. Mm-hmm. And I don't want to touch his money. But what about the larger society that allowed this to happen? Uh, and and I don't necessarily want to hear his apology because I wouldn't believe it anyway. Mm-hmm. Uh, but what about the enablers? You know, what about the people who knew perfectly well what was I mean, going to, on? To, to hear that and to read about that in the book, to me, made me so angry. I I could not imagine uh, be, being a victim in that situation, and and you know, with these enablers around who knew and not doing anything. But this speaks to the issue: what is required of that, you know? And then, in a larger scale, Judith, this topic is something we don't even we can't talk about. We don't talk about it, right? This the abuse. I mean, well, we so, do a whole lot more than we used to. Let's put it cer- certainly, certainly, you know, uh, and I mean, you know, my career began with consciousness raising and now we've had another wave of consciousness raising with me, too, with Black Lives Matter, um, with human rights movements worldwide. Uh, and social justice movements worldwide. Um, I mean, one of the big arguments in both trauma and recovery and in this book is that this is a social and political problem. You need a social and political movement to address it. Um, you, um, and that's true in any situation where you have one Uh, one group uh, that is traditionally dominating another group, whether that, I I mean, I talk about gender-based violence because that's what I know, what I, you know, that's the the population I've worked with all my life. But, you know, whether you're talking about dominance and subordination based on gender, based on race, based on religion, based on caste, based on social class, it's always ultimately maintained by force and violence because people don't like to be dominated. That seems Mm -hmm. to be part of our wiring. Um, But it's also when it's been traditional over centuries, it's maintained by institutions and culture and uh, just just the way things are uh, and and you don't talk about it because it's just it's part of the air you breathe so the first step is always just getting the truth out there mm-hmm. one of the distinctions you make in the book is uh, kind of delineate 
uh, the difference between retributive and restorative justice. Can you share with our listeners what, what that is? Well, retributive justice, which is what we have in this country, what most countries have, is a system of uh, punishment for breaking the law. Uh, in criminal court, the punishments are fines and imprisonment. Um, in civil courts, the punishments are monetary damages. Um, the concept of restorative justice, in contrast, sees justice as making reparations for the harm that has been done rather than punishing someone for breaking the law. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a consensual versus an adversarial process. Um, so in, in, in our justice system, you have prosecution and defense, or you have the, you know, the plaintiff's attorney and the defense attorney, and they fight it out. And pretty much anything except physical combat is allowed. You can, you know, you can, uh, I mean, any amount of harassment and bullying and uh, 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 sort of hostile interrogation of witnesses is, is that's supposed to be how you get at the truth. Mm -hmm. um, in restorative justice, as I understand it, the there is no fact finding mechanism. It depends on uh, the accused or the harm doer, as they're often called, rather than the offender or perpetrator, um, acknowledging responsibility. Um, and then the uh, it, instead of a, a of a judge, you have a restorative justice facilitator, and instead of a jury, you have a group of community people from the community invited by either the the. Uh, person who's been harmed, the harm doer, or the uh, RJ facilitator. And uh, the, the person who's been harmed makes his or her statement at what happened and what, what amends uh, are desired. And the Harm doer acknowledges um, responsibility and apologizes and promises to make amends. And then the whole group comes up with a plan, mm -hmm. a, a, a restitution plan. Um, so, um, I mean, the advantage uh, for the complainer, the complaining witness is, it's a much less hostile process. Um, the advantage for the harm doers, it's much less punitive process. Um, and it's much more tailored to what the person who's been harmed wants. Mm -hmm. But since it doesn't have a fact finding mechanism, uh, it's dependent on the willingness of the perpetrator to acknowledge mm -hmm. what he's done. In the book, you go into obviously more detail about how um, maybe challenging this this process could be and how demanding it could be for those for those involved. But what I'm hearing you say is um, it sounds like what, what the uh, person who has harmed the, the victim, if we can use that word, is wants is the truth is hopefully going to come out. 
Yeah. You know, this, this search, this need to have the truth come out. Were, were there any kind of su- surprises in writing this book for you? Any kind of uh, moments where you're like, whatever, enlightened or things you didn't expect as you were writing this book? Hmm, interesting question. Well, I can't say I was totally surprised, but I was interested, certainly, to learn that um, most most of the people I talk with were not big on punishment, although they did want some controls placed on the mm-hmm. perpetrator. They were also not big on forgiveness. And, mm, you know, right. if, um, I mean, forgiveness is definitely the, the restorative justice agenda, if you will. But most of the survivors I interviewed, they, they didn't want that kind of dialogue. They wanted, if they wanted apology and, and, and restored relationship, it was with the bystanders, mm. not with the perpetrator. I mean, there were some exceptions, and there were one or two people who actually did have a, a, a confrontation with the perpetrator where they received a genuine apology and um, were, you know, and re- repaired a relationship. But that was the definitely the minority, and most mm-hmm. of the survivors said, "Just I, I don't want, I never want to see him again. And I don't, and I, and I don't trust that anything he said would be sincere because I've seen what a manipulator he is." Yeah, uh, and in the book, book you talk about that this this topic of forgi- forgiveness, which I found very interesting, and of course, it's very popular in our culture, right? We need to forgive to move on, and I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, but w- in the book, there's a point at which maybe a uh, victim or survivor is talking, and she was saying, "Well, I don't need to forgive that person, but I need to kind of more of an inward, personal forgiving to move on." Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, there are really two different kinds. Uh, people use that word in two different ways. One is uh, where there really has been the healing of a relationship where the person has received what feels like a genuine, remorseful, um, empathic apology and promise to make amends and and that can be feel incredibly liberating. It's just sort of people feel burdened by their resentment and mm-hmm. and, and grievance and revenge fantasies. They don't like having them. They don't like being angry all the time. And they it, so it's wonderful when it just lifts. You know. Then there's another kind of forgiveness that doesn't involve. A relationship at all that just involves, as you say, letting go, moving on. Mm-hmm. That's a very different psychological process. It involves grieving um, for everything that has been destroyed and can't be repaired, um, for the life one might have had if this hadn't happened. You know, um, and one of the survivors I interviewed put it very succinctly. I think she said. Forgiveness is giving up all hope of a better past. It took me a minute to, you know, figure out what she meant by that. Um, But it meant the fantasy that this can be made right. Um, And and that's much more of a working through in psychotherapy. Um, Where, as we kind of get ready to close out here... What is your hope for the readers of this? And and secondly, who is this book for? Oh gosh. Um, well, it, it's 
I guess it's for general readership. I mean, it's certainly for survivors. It's certainly for mental health professionals. It's also for people who are interested in law and justice and social movements and um, and um, and how to make a better world. So that's a lot of people. Um, <laughs> <Hopefully. laughs> um, and I'm sorry, what was your other question? What, what is your hope for the readers? What did you want to get out of this book? Uh, find someone else to um, talk about this with and don't be alone with it. And uh, Uh, find your voice and find your agency and let's, this is, uh, this is the longest revolution. Let's mm -hmm. get it going. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, a lot of people who are listening to this are therapists, are survivors. And I think if you are a therapist, uh, this is uh, uh, you, you've got to read this book and it it will ignite, I think, a fire in you. Um, where do you see, you know, you talked about the Me Too movement and uh, Black Lives Matter and so forth. Do you see a, uh, a, 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 a this new wave moving uh, forward of, of consciousness? Yes and no. Um, I mean, I see, yes, I see it moving forward and I see tremendous backlash. And that's true of democracy movements and social justice movements worldwide. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, all right, Judith, as we kind of close out here, uh, for those people who are listening to this, for therapists, seasoned and, and even newer therapists alike, <laughs> Um, what would you say to what would you say to a therapist who is interested in learning about trauma in maybe beginning to work with people who've been impacted by trauma? What would you say to them? Don't do it alone. Don't do it that's, alone. That's what I always say to trainees and and people who want to work in this field um, because you you never get used to it, uh, and and if you do get used to it, you're probably burning out. Mm. Um, so, and, and you think you've heard everything, but there's always going to be something that a patient tells you that you just couldn't in your wildest imagination think that one human being would do to another human being. Mm -hmm. So find your support group. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate that. And, and again, I think, you know, for me, reading through this book, um, you know, you, you talked about your hope would be like maybe people would help create a better world. And I think you, you can't not read this book and, and feel that and want to go out there and be part of make making things better for people. And I think that was a huge kind of eye opener for me because I think it's very easy to think that, you know, healing takes place in some therapy room right between one person and another person and you're saying well that that's part of it but there's a larger part of it here and we're all a part of it whether we want to believe that or not and that to me is is it's it's eye opening and it's 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 uh it it's scary because so much of it depends on the people around us too we are social creatures for better or worse <laughs> right um, all right, Judith, what's the best way for people to get in contact with you if they want to reach out? Um, I don't have any social media. I'm a very 20th century person, um, but people seem to be able to find me uh, by a detective Google. So. Okay, we'll leave it at that. Uh, Dr. Herman, it was an honor sincerely having you on this podcast. I want to thank you so much for being here. And thank you very much for having me. Enjoy. Okay. Talking with you. Thank you.